Dr. Michael Osterholm, welcome to TEDx Minneapolis. Well, thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Great. You are a leading COVID expert, but I'd like to go somewhere a little different. If we were at a dinner party and you were going to explain what you do in very simple terms so that I could understand, how would you explain what you do? Well, first of all, I think during the COVID pandemic, I actually have had multiple jobs and they've changed with time. Um, I went into this pandemic really as someone who has uh, attempted to understand what the future might look like and predict what might be happening. Mm -hmm. And so when people ask me what I do, as I say, well, I try to interpret this virus in a way that is both from a science standpoint, hopefully helpful, and then I think from a standpoint of just getting through. You know, I'm I'm, I may be an epidemiologist, but I'm also a dad, I'm a, a grandfather, I'm a friend, I'm a colleague, you know, I'm, I'm a partner, and I have all the same challenges of trying to live my life every day as everybody else. So virus predictor, I've heard you say medical detective. Yeah, medical detective, that's my <laughs> job, is to try to figure out who done it. okay? That's how I got into this business as a young boy reading those. So it's really, yeah, that's... That's probably the case. So I don't know what I do today for sure. I do a lot of different things, okay? A lot okay? of different identities. That's where we'd like to go, is to understand the man behind this, lay the foundation, and get an idea about your journey, your expertise, and your lessons learned. So that's where I'm gonna go with this okay. next question. And that is a general observation, is that when I listen to your recordings, they're not only hard-hitting scientific kinds of predictions or facts or explanations, but sometimes they take a very mindful pivot to kindness, to celebrations of life. I even heard you this week reciting lyrics to a very light and hopeful song that warmed my heart. So is that you or is that what you think we all need? Well, I'm not sure that they're different. Okay. Because I think I need what everybody else needs. Yeah. And a lot of other people probably need what I need. You know, I, I come at this work, if, if you call it that, as an avocation. You know, understanding that there are both very dark sides and very bright sides of life. And they can happen on the same day to the same person. And it's how you look at life. So the roots of your training in both biology and political science seem very unique. And how did those two things come together for you at the university? Well, you know, first of all, it was an accident. Okay. Uh, and so I don't want to take more credit than is due. Um, and it really is part of an avocation, you might say. You know, I've, I've been very interested in biology and that whole area. But, you know, I realized early on even in my college years, that all this science is really useless if it's just a bunch of papers or books sitting on a shelf. And it's all about the policy and how do things get implemented. At the same time, I've seen policies that have been really very detrimental to all of us because they weren't informed by the science. Right. You mentioned being a visionary. Does that come naturally to you? Do you what gives you the ability to see around corners or see things that other people don't? You know, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a visionary. Okay. I, I think I'm a dot connector. Okay. And, you know, sometimes you can extrapolate where a line is going to go if you have enough dots in a row sure. and you just figure it out. And so I think for me, it's more about being a dot connector. Uh, you know, I, I have a sense, I think, that when I, when I look at the challenges that we have in the world today, so many of these are actually what I guess I would call simple extrapolations to the future. Um, you know, so many times, like I said, when I talked about the number of cases that I thought would ha deaths would happen with COVID, mm -hmm. that wasn't some great mathematical model that did just some simple math and say, well, if this happens, this many people get infected, this happens. And so it really is just trying to lay out there what the future might look like and not because I'm you know, you're trying to be somehow clairvoyant. It's because, okay, we got to prepare for this. Yeah. What are the policies? What are the issues we have to deal with? I mean, e even today, if you take COVID, it's asking, what is this world going to look like? You know, COVID right now in the minds of most people is done and gone. It's over with, okay? They're done with it. The virus isn't done with it. And 
most people don't realize that at 450 deaths a day, which is what's happening in this high plains, right. that's 164,000 deaths a year. And that makes it the number four cause of death in the United States. Wow. Now, if you'd said to me three years ago, something that's not a big problem anymore is, still the, is suddenly the number four cause of death in the world, or in, in the United States. So I would cancer, say heart disease. Yep, and accidents. Accidents and COVID. And then COVID. Do people ever try to shake you up? Do you get ever feel defensive? How do you handle those kinds of situations? You know, I, th I think I'm, I, I, I can't say that I get shaken up anymore because it's, it's what's important in life that helps ground you. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the moment that my first major shaking up in public health, and this became a pattern that has given me a sense of what's important and what's not. In 1980, there was a case, many cases, but this one, was a young 16-year-old girl from the wow. Twin Cities wow. who developed toxic shock syndrome. And I was at her intensive care bed, and her mother, looking at her, holding my hand and her hand, crying. And what she was crying about was how badly her daughter looked because she gained about 80 pounds of fluid and you couldn't distinguish her from the pictures. And then you realize what's important. You know, uh, probably one of the most um, amazing moments in terms of pain was a large outbreak of, men of meningitis that occurred in Mankato, Minnesota back in 1995. And on one individual died in the high school. There were a number of cases, but one died. And I was at his bedside, 16 years old. And he was born on the exact same day as my daughter. Oh. Not just a birth date, the same day. Well, that night, I drove back from Mankato to our, my home here in the Twin Cities for a 15-minute visit just to sit next to my daughter's bed oh. as she slept. Oh. And then I turn around and went back to Mankato. That's when you understand what's important. So all the other stuff, yeah. you know, what hurts, what makes you who you are, doesn't matter nearly as much as when you remember those stories. Thank and you. you remember what today I'm trying to do is make sure as many of those stories don't happen yeah. as possible. Yeah. You may know that at TEDx Minneapolis, one of our speakers within this event is Ben O'Donnell. Mm -hmm. And Ben was the first instance of a young Minnesotan, a very healthy athlete at that, who was placed on a ventilator in an ECMO oxygen tank while his lungs fought the disease. And the caregivers recalled being absolutely shocked by the severity of his situation. And they said anything that could go wrong did go wrong for Ben. Is there a genetic explanation about why COVID is severe in one person and less severe in another? I just experienced a story of my neighbor telling me her elderly 101-year-old dad got COVID and he just had the sniffles. Yeah. So, you know, how does this happen when people are equally exposed to the virus? Remember those three famous words? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, clearly, there are risk factors that have an impact on how the virus is in your lungs, what your immune response is like, right. that we do know play a role in increasing your likelihood of severe right. illness. Also, when you got infected, it has a big impact because now the BA5 strain that we see surely causes a lot of infections, but generally speaking, milder. Whereas if you got an earlier strain, you didn't have as many infections, but when they hit, they could hit hard. Right. The other piece of this, though, is that we've gotten better at medical management of cases where up front, we can do things to keep people from going down that road of darkness, such as you just described, which was early in the pandemic, right. and we were learning. Yes. I mean, the learning curve for medical care for these patients was remarkable. I mean, if you, I think, Every intensive care unit in the world was an, a university unto its own in terms of learning, research, and teaching. And so, in that sense, 
I'm very, we're very fortunate he survived, you know, and, and uh, he has been an incredible spokesman since that time to speak out about the importance of vaccination or all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think that the challenge we have today, which I could tell you who's going to have a severe illness and who's not, and we don't know. That's why you have to anticipate that. So there's nothing right now from a selective pressure that would tell us, oh, it's going to get milder and milder and milder. And that's the challenge, I think, that we're all having right now. None of us know where this is going to go. At TEDx Minneapolis, we always focus on ideas that are worth spreading. What would you like people to do, think, or feel differently about your talk or about your career or what you've learned so far? Well, I think I'd come back to our original conversation. Um, in a world that is full of challenge, in a world that has lots of pain, uh, in a world where we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and that lack of clarity is often so uncomfortable, if there's one guiding principle, if all else fails, just be kind. You know, and, and you can disagree or you can have any number of bad things happen, but be kind. And I think that that's something we're missing a lot of today. So I would say my career, if, if nothing else, the one four letter word that I would want to be remembered for is not data, you know, not, not things like that. It's, it's kind. Thank you, Dr. Osterholm, from all of us here at TEDx Minneapolis. We really appreciate you coming in. We appreciate you being part of our event. Your career and your voice is important and formidable, and what a wonderful legacy and brand you've created. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Wow, she's good. <laughs>